to the word of the Lord this morning. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, for the last few months, as I have been praying and preparing uh, for uh, as a church for the messages from the Lord, you know, I was I was doing the Bible study, the Acts Bible study, and then uh, a couple months ago, I told you, okay, we're going to take a break from that, and then we did the anniversary series. But before that, uh, the Lord has been dealing with my heart about uh, doing. Uh, doing a series, not a long series, but a series on Christians and our emotions. Uh, and he, he prompted that in my heart because I'd been talking with various people who, Christians in Lighthouse and outside of Lighthouse as well, who were really, really struggling with some, some t hard feelings. Um, some sometimes great fears, sometimes uh, anger, other things like that, all, all sorts of these feelings. Um, even sometimes, if I were to ask you, for example, right now, how many of you have ever awakened in the morning and you just didn't feel that you were saved? Raise your hand, please. How many of you know that you're a liar? All of us have awakened at times, we, we wake up or whatever, and we feel like, I'm just not, I don't feel saved, right? I just don't feel saved. Or we wake up feeling, there's something wrong, we're upset. And the Lord has been talking to me about how do we deal with emotions as Christians? How do we deal with these feelings? What's real, what's not real, what's true, what's not true? And... Um, and so I've been doing some reading and some studying and some praying and some preparation. I've been praying for myself and praying for you as well. And this series will be a little bit different from what I usually do. It's going to be a, a, a quite practical. And so the series is going to be you and your feelings. And I've chosen emojis because, you know, that is the modern way to express our feelings, right? It's the, sh it's the shortcut. You know, you click it. Uh, I was reading something online uh, from English teachers, and I know there's some other English teachers. There are teachers in this group as well. And um, all the English teachers bemoan the rise of text messages and emojis um, because people aren't able to write properly anymore um, because they'll say C and then U instead of S-E-E-Y-O-U or, or something like that. Or we'll use, a little, um, we'll use a little icon or a little emoji to express how we feel. So I thought, okay, well, that's a pretty good way to sort of, uh, for, to, to kind of come into this. So the series is uh, You and Your Feelings and I include myself and my feelings. Um, and we're going to talk about what does the Bible say? Am I a bad Christian when I feel this? Have I done something wrong when I, when I feel this way or when I wake up in the morning? Or it may be even in the night you've had a really bad dream in the night and you wake up in the morning and you feel so guilty because of this dream you have. How do you handle that? And, and what does the Bible say about these things? Is it me? Is it God? Is it the devil? So we're going to be taking a few... Uh, um, uh, messages and looking at this and I trust it will be really helpful to you I believe it will be because the Holy Spirit's put it on my heart and uh, I was going to start out with the foundation now this is what the Bible says about feelings and I was praying about it this week and towards the weekend the Holy Spirit was very specific with me and said basically jump right in and I want you to talk about uh, worry, anxiety, and fear. So we're going to go at it a little bit diff differently rather than having this foundation of, okay, we're going to do this first and this, and this is what the Bible says about feelings. Now let's talk about this. We're going to jump right in. Living free from worry, anxiety, and fear. And um, so this is what God has put on my heart, and I think it's appropriate for what's going on in Hong Kong right now, and it's appropriate for what many of you are facing as well. So we're going to see what the Bible says about uh, worry, anxiety, and fear. And what I'm going to say to you right now at the very beginning is this. You and I can live lives free of worry, anxiety, and fear. Now, some of you are looking at me like, huh, I've lived with worry, anxiety, and fear all my life. A lot of people have. But if we look at what the Bible says and what God tells us to do, we can live without worry, without anxiety, and without fear. And we're going to see, and we're going to see how. 
I've put all of these three together. We could divide them if we wanted to, but I, I don't want to take a long, long time in these series. So we'll get as far as we can today. But I've put these three together because worry, anxiety, and fear are really on a continuum, if you will. They're really the same emotion, but they're just different in intensity, right? You could think of it this way. Worry is at one end, and a worry is a little tiny toy poodle. At the other end is fear, and it's a pit bull, okay? Or some other really aggressive, uh, uh, a Malinois, or another perhaps a, a fairly aggressive animal, or a, something like that. So from there to there, worry, anxiety, and fear. But the Bible tells us how to deal with each one of them. And so we're going to look at this today. I'll go ahead and let you know. Uh, in the Bible, in our thinking, we divide worry and anxiety. We know what fear is, we know what worry is, and we know what anxiety is. The Bible doesn't make a lot of difference between worry and anxiety, okay? Um, that's something that we do uh, in, in our time and in our days. Uh, depending on your translation, the Bible will also, instead of anxiety, the Bible may also say cares. Uh, uh, cast, uh, for example, we're going to look at 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, the, uh, if, depending on your translation, it will be cast your anxieties on him. Uh, and then Matthew 6 and Luke 12, we'll come to it a little bit later. But those two passages talk a lot about worry. Why are you worrying about what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear? Don't you know that your father knows that you need these things and he will provide? So that so worry is used there. But in the Greek, it's generally a very similar word. And so as we look at these, uh, fear, this word in the Greek and also in the Hebrew as well, this word fear, and I don't mean the fear of the Lord, okay? I mean the bad type of fear, the fear that paralyzes us, the fear that keeps us awake at night, the fear that we look at the future and it's a bleak future because we're thinking, what if this happens, this might happen, that type of fear. So fear at that end, the, the, the strong word that we're all aware of, it may be something that we live with a lot, or it may be some, something that suddenly flows over us, or it's suddenly like a wave. Have you ever had that type of fear before? Fear, just, it just overwhelmed you all of a sudden, didn't it? And it's almost like uh, if you've ever gone to the, o to the seaside before in the ocean, and, and I've experienced both of these things, it's like you're out in the water and suddenly a big wave, you weren't expecting it, and a big wave, whoop, it just knocks you over and rolls you over and over and over. And you get up, you didn't see it coming, but it hit you. You get up and... Um, Five seconds later, as you are staggering there trying to get, get your breath and pull the sand out of your hair, another wave, whoop, it comes over and it tumbles you again. And sometimes fear is like that, isn't it? Um, and at other times, fear is just sort of a steady state in our lives. In the Bible, the word fear, as we're talking about it this morning, the base meaning of the word has to do with, and it, and it means to flight, uh, it means flight or to run. And for a lot of us, when, uh, when we feel fear, it, that's, the, that's our, our response, isn't it? Just to run or to run away. So that's the meaning, the underlying meaning in the Bible. Worry and anxiety to me are really interesting because uh, it has a different uh, meaning in the Greek and in the Hebrew, Hebrew, but especially in the Greek. And worry and anxiety, the words in Greek originally in the Bible, in the New Testament, mean to be pulled apart. It means to be pulled in, in more than one direction. Now think for a minute, those of you that struggle with worry and struggle with anxiety, how do you feel when worry and anxiety are crowding your mind and weighing down your heart? How do you feel? You feel pulled apart, don't you? And when we have worry and anxiety, it's hard to, it's hard to make good decisions, isn't it? How often do we make good decisions when we are living with worry, anxiety, and fear? We almost always make really bad decisions um, when we're dealing with that. And we feel pulled apart. It's hard to think straight. It's hard to think clear. It's hard to pray, isn't it, when, when we're worried? But God's Word will tell us and show us this morning how to deal with these things. And so 
uh, as I was preparing, as I was looking at this, I went back and did, did, did a little bit of digging and a little bit of research. I can only give you the statistics for the U.S. I don't know your countries, but I would imagine the U.S. St statistics are probably similar to most countries. The number one prescribed medicine in the U.S. is not for blood pressure. It is not for high cholesterol. It is not for diabetes. It is not for any one of these things. The number one prescribed medicine in the U.S. is for anxiety and stress. Did you know that? Anxiety and stress. You knew that, right? You could feel that, right? Number one, by far. Number one, by far. And that's the U.S. as a whole, and I think that's probably like most of us. And what, as we get into this this morning, what I want to say is this. Living with worry and anxiety and fear as Christians is common, but it's not normal. Let me say it again. As a Christian, living with worry, anxiety, and fear is common. If I were to ask you this morning, how many of you right now are struggling with worry? A lot of you would raise your hands. Or anxiety more of you might raise your hands. Um, and fear, some of you would raise your hands as well. And it, I think most of you would agree with me, we are so used to it being part of our lives that we have accepted it as the normal way of living. And we kind of struggle and we'll pray a little bit, but still it's in our lives and it'll kind of go away, but then it comes back again and we're, we're, we're bowed under. And what I want us to see this morning is it is common, but it's not normal. And God's going to show us in his word, we're going to look at his word, how we can live the normal Christian life, which is a life free from worry, anxiety, and fear. Amen? Amen. Well, let me ask you something. Did God make us with worry and anxiety and fear? Where did it come from? We go all the way back to Genesis, and we know the story of creation. And if you go back and read in Genesis in the story of creation, even before man was made, uh, by the way, God has feelings. Did you know that? He's not just up there in a cocoon, no feelings or whatever. God made us in his image. We have feelings. God has feelings. And he made us in his image. And when we look at the story of creation, God made this and it says, he looked and it was good. God made, created this. He looked and it was good. God, and then in the end, and God made man in his image, and he looked, and it was very good. There, some of you remembered. It was very good. So it doesn't say pleasure in Genesis in these first chapters, in these first verses, but what is implied is there was pleasure in God's heart as he looked at his creation. And then when he looked at mankind that he had made, there was great pleasure because he saw it was very good. No bad emotions, no worry, no fear, no anxiety. Adam and Eve lived in the garden and there was no fear of, is God pleased with me or not? And let me ask you something because we're going to talk about this in just a minute. How many of you, especially you had perhaps dysfunctional families or all of us have imperfect families, by the way. All of us have imperfect families. And if I were to ask you, how many of you growing up felt like you had to do something to earn your mother's or your father's approval? I'll bet majority would raise their hands this morning. You, you felt, I have to do something. And if I do this, I will earn my parents' love. I will earn my parents' approval. What a terrible way to grow up. And many of us have grown up that way. But as we look at it, we, we become Christians and we come into the family of God. And because of how we lived in our earthly lives, we come into God's family and we still have this feeling about God, don't we? I've got to do something. If I do this, God will be pleased with me. If I do this, I'll have his approval. Or we live our lives in fear, our Christian lives in fear. Does God really love me? Does God really love me? Think about this. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve never had a single question a single worry, a single fear. Does God really love me? Does he really care about me? They never had a single worry. Will I have enough to eat? 
They never had a single worry. Will I have a disease? Nothing, none of these things. No worry, no anxiety, no fear in any way. And then the enemy came. The devil came to do what? Three words. Steal, kill, destroy. And that's who he is. And that's what he does. And that's his character. And he comes into the garden. Adam and Eve believe the lie of the devil. And the lie of the devil is that the boundaries of God don't eat this fruit. That the boundaries of God will limit them and limit their pleasure. Ding, 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 ding. The devil has no new lies. Did you know that? No new lies. How many of you have ever reached a boundary? You know you shouldn't. You know you whatever. But you want to, ah, uh, and you break through that boundary, and instead of pleasure, well, you may have momentary pleasure, you have, may have momentary satisfaction, but instead, you, fi you find that what you've done in believing the lie of the enemy brings you sadness and pain and harm. All of us have discovered that. But Adam and Eve believe the lie, they eat the fruit, and then look, we see what happens. The man and his wife, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, they heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. You know what, brothers and sisters? There are also no new creative ways that man, that sinful man interacts with God, right? Man hides from God. Man runs from God so, so often. And then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? May I give you a footnote? May I give you a freebie here that's not part of the message, but I'll give it to you anyhow. When God asks questions, it is never to get information. <laughs> never. When God speaks to you and he's asking, he, never, he doesn't need to, he already knows. God always asks questions for our sake, not for his sake. And he says, where are you? He already knew where they were. And man replied, Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden. Look with me very carefully at verse 10. So I hid. I was what? I was afraid because I was naked. And when sin enters and when the devil had his way and began his plan in people's lives, fear entered the picture. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. And there's the beginning of it in man as we see. And he hasn't changed to this day. So fear enters. He, he was afraid because he was naked. Let me ask you something. And this, is a, this is another lie as well. Man says, I was afraid because I was naked. But man was now afraid of God, right? He was ashamed. God's angry at me. I've done something wrong. Brothers and sisters, may I say something to you this morning? Whether you are a Christian or not, God is not angry at you. Listen carefully. I know that there's some people here this morning. You do not yet have a real relationship with God. And what I want to say to you is this. God is not angry with you. He loves you. He loves you. And for those of you who are children of God, how much more? God is not angry with you. He loves you. Don't run from him and don't hide from him. But fear entered. And I want to take it full circle and think with me, if we go forward, Jesus comes to earth, fear has entered, and worry, anxiety, and fear becomes part of uh, the a common part of human life. And then Jesus comes and he walks on the earth and he lives as a man. And then he goes to the cross and he takes your sin and my sin, listen carefully, he takes your worry and my worry. He takes your anxiety and my anxiety. Your fear and my fear. All on himself. All these things that you have felt, Jesus felt them also. All these things that you struggle with, Jesus took that and felt that in himself as a man. And he went to the cross and he died. And then he rose again. In Hebrews 2, I'm going to go ahead and read it for you right now. Wonderful. It's not up here. It's not up here, but I'm just going to read it to you. It'll make it easier because Stella doesn't have to translate. But if you're taking notes, let me read this to you in Hebrews 2, uh, chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, 
shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? Jesus did that so that you and I don't have to be afraid. I, I was listening to a message that uh, a, a, a pastor was brought this brought this uh, passage up, and I loved how he said it. He said, "He said I'm not going to die." And I thought to myself, "Well, you're this and this and this age. You may die." But I, I appreciated so much how he said it because so many people do. We live with the fear of death, and he said, "I'm not going to die." He said, when I take my last breath here, whether it's breathing out or breathing in, he said, the very next breath I take is going to be the air of heaven. And I was so moved when I heard that. I, isn't that wonderful? Because yes. a lot of us are kind of afraid of death, aren't we? We, we, we or we think, and, and to us it looks like such a long, drawn-out process or whatever. And this, this preacher just, he said, I'm not going to die. He said, my last breath here then I'll have my first breath in heaven. And he said, and as my senses dull here, he said, they're going to awaken to a perfect heaven. Isn't that beautiful? He said, as I, he said, as my eyes close here and I lose the vision of earth, I will open my eyes to the vision of heaven for eternity. Let us be encouraged, brothers and sisters, truly, truly. Jesus did everything he could to set you and me free from the fear of death. When Jesus comes back after the resurrection that night, and this is, this is what I was getting to, I, I threw that in on the, um, just as an extra, in John 20 and John chapter 20 and verses 19 and 21, in the morning he has appeared to Mary Magdalene, uh, and then he also has appeared to Peter, right? But those are private, those are private conversations. But then that night, all of the disciples are in the room the door is locked, and the Bible says they're afraid, right? They're afraid of the Jews. They see what has happened to Jesus. They're all gathered together, and they're so afraid. What will happen? What will happen? And the Bible says that Jesus suddenly appeared in their midst, right? He suddenly appeared in their midst. Okay, we know our Bibles fairly well. Here's my question to you. What is the first thing that Jesus says to his fearful disciples? Very first thing. What? He says, peace be with you. That's the very verse, first thing. Here's this beautiful, beautiful picture. Sin enters in the Garden of Eden that very first time, and suddenly man is afraid. And now Jesus buys back. Jesus begins to undo what began in the Garden of Eden. And as he goes to the cross, and as he is resurrected, he undoes what the devil has done in the very beginning. He buys back, and the very first thing he says to fearful disciples is, Peace be with you. And a, and a verse or two later, he says it again. Peace be with you. Worry, anxiety, and fear rob us of peace, don't they? Have you ever tried to sleep at night and you were worried about something? And it's always worse at night, right? And it gets bigger at night, right? The, 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 the five-foot monster becomes a ten-foot monster at night, and he's going to jump on you. I, believe me. Do you know why? You're all laughing because you know it's true, and I use that example from personal experience. You know, and it just gets worse and worse and wor worse at night. Um, and we're robbed of our peace. Jesus came to bring peace back to our hearts and our lives, that we might live free from every fear, every worry, and every anxiety. Amen. Amen. I want to, sorry, my throat's dry this morning, so I'm drinking a lot. As I was preparing, I came back and added something to my notes, and we're going to look at about five or six practical steps for, for worry, uh, anxiety, and, free, f and fear, living free from them. But I was reminded of something as I was finishing uh, my preparation, my notes last night, so I went back and put it in. And this is part of it. One of the reasons we struggle with worry and anxiety and fear is because we don't really trust our Heavenly Father. I'm not talking about God, but I'm talking about God as our Father, 
God is our Heavenly Father. We, we're afraid, and a lot of times it's because maybe we didn't have a good relationship with earthly fathers, and that's pretty common. But see, when God brings us, when God, our Heavenly Father, brings us into our family, He shows His love to us, and He gives us His Word so that we can be transformed, and we can be remade again, so that we can have the right relationship with God our Father. And when we have the right relationship with Him, and that doesn't just mean freedom from our sins. It doesn't just mean salvation. It means right relationship. It's a family relationship. And so God is doing that, and God wants to do that in us because when that relationship, when we, when we have a, 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 the wrong view of God, and when we think, I've got, to, I, uh, I've got to do something or He's not pleased with me. I love God, but I don't know if He really loves me, or God has a favorite and it's not me. That person, Pastor Renee is God's favorite because he's a pastor. Did you know that? God loves Pastor Renee a little bit more than He loves you because he's a pastor. Well, that's heresy, right? That's a lie. That's a lie. God loves every single one of us equally. He, he is pleased with us. He takes pleasure in us. And as I was preparing last night, here, here's one of the keys for us. Remember the story I told you a few years ago about our church in the U.S. and a man in the church died when he was quite young and he left, he left his wife behind and two young children, um, a, a young preteen girl and then um, a young guy that was, a young, I should say, boy, who was, uh, that was, he was barely a teenager if he was a teenager. I don't know, maybe he was 12, maybe 13, something like that. And mom and dad were pastoring, dad was pastoring the church at that time. And after the funeral that day, as mom walked out, uh, the boy was missing. Didn't, didn't know where he was, and mom walked outside, and in their family car, in the, in the driveway, was the young boy, and he was in the back seat, and he was in the back seat sobbing, sobbing uncontrollably, just crying and crying and crying. And so mom, being mom, of course, got in the back seat with him and comforted him and hugged him, and he was crying, not only because his dad was gone, but he was overwhelmed with worry and anxiety and fear because his thought was, remember this, I told you this story, his thought was, I'm now responsible to take care of, make sure your phones are off, folks. That's an important point in the message. If you, if you need to, you go outside. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let's get our focus back. Okay. He was overwhelmed because he figured, I'm the boy in the family. I now have to be the man. His dad was gone. And so here he was, maybe 12 or 13 years old, and he was figuring out, okay, I have to stop school, and I'm going to have to find a job. And I've got to take care of my mom, and I've got to take care of my sister. I still cry when I think about it. That breaks our hearts, doesn't it? And, we, and, and those of you especially who are parents or who care for young children, your hearts even more, I don't have children, but your hearts even more are heartbroken when you hear that because you think, no, parents take care of children. He's 12 years old. It's not his responsibility to get a job, to quit school, the sixth grade or the seventh grade, and provide for the family and to provide for the sister. No, of course not. Of course not. It's not his responsibility. You and I understand that in the natural, but you know what, brothers and sisters? When we come into the family of God, and all of these things come into our lives and worry nags at us and anxiety is like a blanket that covers us and fear roars over our lives. What will I do? How will I take care of this? What if this happens? How can this be? All of these things, we respond in the same way that that little boy did who was sobbing in the back seat of the car because we think I've got to handle it. I've got to control it. What if this happens? What if I fail? What if they don't like me? What if I am rejected? What if I can't this? All of these things, all of these things. And our Heavenly Father says to us, you're not an orphan. You're not responsible. I am your Father and I am your good father, and I am your loving father, and I want to take care of you, 
and I'm responsible to take care of you. I'm responsible to take care of you. And if you and I, as children of God, can get that in our hearts, get that in our hearts, it will help us in our battle against worry, anxiety, and fear. And it is a battle. I, I'll tell you this morning, we can't just say, boom, I reject you, worry, anxiety, and fear. It, it doesn't, now you can do that in part, but there are things that we have to do. But it is truth that will change us, that will help us to live in the right way. As we understand, God is my Father. He loves me. Um, let, let me, let's see, I think Ying and Jocelyn, they're, they're upstairs taking care of their baby right now, I think. But uh, I, I was going to get them because they're the, they, they have the youngest, uh, they have the youngest child. But many of you are parents here, or you've taken, you know, you have small children that you love. Let me ask you something. Here you have this child, this boy, this girl, or this little baby. Do you remember how you have felt about your child? Did you begrudge taking care of your child? Did you begrudge uh, buying clothes for your child? Did you, oh, okay, well, I'll use Christy. She's a good example. She's got a two-year-old now? Okay. Did you begrudge buying clothes? Or Christy, do you walk down the street and you look and there hanging up is a cute little, is a cute little outfit and you go, oh, this will be perfect on. Exactly. What's the child's exactly. name? CJ. CJ. Oh, okay, CJ. It will be perfect. Exactly, right? Christy wants to and loves to and takes pleasure in providing for her child. Brothers and sisters, your Heavenly Father wants to, loves to, takes pleasure in providing for you. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be afraid. Brothers and sisters, those things are his responsibilities. They're not yours. They're not yours. So, as we look at this, did you know that in the Bible, we are going to look at some other verses, and we're going to look at them right now. I want you to look at some things in the Bible. Look at these two verses. Uh, we know this verse very well. Uh, so Philippians 4, 6 tells us, don't be anxious, do not be anxious about anything. So God tells us to do that. How many of you broke that commandment this morning already? Some, yeah? Okay, thank you. You broke it already this morning. Okay, uh, look at Matthew 6, 25, 31, 34. I've just pulled up some of the passages. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Verse 31, so don't worry, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? These are the things of this world. And then verse 34, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. How many of you in the last two days, you've already been worrying about tomorrow? Yeah? You've been worrying about tomorrow? <laughs> okay. Uh, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you know that the commands not to worry, <clears throat> not to be anxious, and not to be afraid, don't worry, don't be afraid, do not fear, do you know that this command is the most common command in the Bible? Did you know that? More than any other command, more than be holy, do this, do that. The commands, don't be afraid, is the number one command in the Bible. Well over a hundred times. Well over a hundred times. So, let me ask you another question. I I'll ask the question, then I'll drink while you think of it. If God asks us or tells us to do something or not to do something, is he just playing around with us, or is it possible to do what he says to do? Possible, not possible. It's possible. God does not ask us to do something that we cannot do. That's not the type of God he is. And so God tells us, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Cast your anxiety on me. So how do we do that? And some of you are right now are saying, Pastor Jennifer, I've been waiting for this the whole time. Get to the, how do we do it? Um, so let's look at some things. So if God, if God says do it, we can do it, right? Okay, here's the practical part. I'm going to give you five or six steps, and then, we'll, and then, uh, and then we will, we'll look at some things. So number one, consider, I like this one a lot. Okay, uh, and this one was transforming for me. Consider worry, anxiety, and fear as agents of the enemy. Agents of the enemy. Um, if, you, if you have an anxious thought, 
if you're worried, all these things, it is not from you. Sometimes we say, oh, I'm just a worrier. No, you're not. G did you think God made you a worrier? Now, the devil makes us worriers sometimes, doesn't he? And sometimes we get so used to worrying, we develop habits of worry. And then, you know what the devil says? When we develop bad habits like this, I think the devil kind of says, ha, my job is done. I don't, even, I don't even have to work on them anymore. They've, got it. They've already got a bad habit. They don't even need it. They don't need any help from me. They can do it all by themselves. You, you know what I mean? That's, I'm, I'm kind of mocking, but I'm kind of not, right? And because some, some of us can really develop these habits. And so consider worry, anxiety, and fear as agents of the enemy. Did God make you to worry? Yes or no? Did God make you to be anxious? No. Does God want you to be afraid? It doesn't come from him. It comes from the devil. It comes from the devil. I... I was speaking, it was with somebody in Lighthouse, this was a few years ago, and she, ca she came to me and she was having terrible thoughts, terrible thoughts that were terrifying her. I mean, terrifying her. And I remember talking with her and praying and realizing, this is not who you are. You are not this type of person. This is not from you. This is from the devil. So I want to say something right now to all of us now, to all of us. If worry is hitting your mind, worry a lot of times comes like an arrow, right? I, I think of it this way. You know, something goes along and it's like an arrow that hits you and you start worrying. Or you wake up in the morning, oh, what about this and what about that? It didn't come from God and it didn't come from you. Worry comes from the devil. I love this passage in... Uh, uh, I, I, and to me, I kind of think of this as, as worry. In Ephesians chapter 6, um, when, when Paul is writing about taking up the, uh, the whole armor of God to be protected against the devil, I like this part especially. In addition to, uh, this is Ephesians 6 verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, and faith comes from the word of God comes from the Word of God. God gives us a gift of faith, but also it's, it comes from the Word of God. And it says, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. That's how we extinguish the shield of faith. And for me, I kind of imagine the, the, air, the, the devil shooting arrows of worry at us. Bing, 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 trying to hit us. And a lot of times it hits the mark, right? Because we haven't learned, God, that's not from you. We haven't learned, God, it may be common, but it's not normal. We haven't learned, God, you have given me tools and authority so that I do not have to accept the agents of the enemy, whether it is thoughts of worry, whether it is anxiety like a blanket that depresses. Anxiety often is more, um, it's kind of generalized, isn't it? Just kind of an overall, just kind of anxious, or fear that really is overwhelming. It, understand it, it, once you realize that you are not a fearful, anxious, or, or, or a worrying person, you're not fearful, you're not weak, you're not any one of these things. It comes from the enemy and he is putting it in your life to destroy your life and rob you of your joy and to paralyze you and to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. When you and I are afraid or worrying or fearful, we won't take the steps that God wants us to take. We won't do what he wants us to do. Why? But what if this? What if that? That doesn't come from God. It doesn't come from God. Here's a scripture for us. A great one. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God has not... Let's read it together. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. I love that. Do you know that, especially if you are struggling with fear, when I described earlier that overwhelming fear that, you, that really, really paralyzes, it's not just... <clears throat> A thought. It's not just a thing. There is a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of fear that comes from the enemy. A few months ago, I was praying about something in, my, in the car as I was driving to church. And it was something I've been praying for for several years. And by the way, brothers and sisters, I hope all of us have long-term prayer projects in our lives that we keep on praying for. Don't give up praying for it. Don't give up. Be faithful in prayer as we see. And I was praying about it, and all of a sudden, in relation to this particular uh, uh, 
matter that I was praying about and had been praying about, all it, this was, in fact, this was only about a month ago, so it's really fresh in my mind. I'm just giving you an example. All of a sudden, as I was driving, I, I can't, I don't know that I've ever felt this before. <clears throat> Suddenly, fear gripped my heart out of nowhere, out, truly out of nowhere. I was just praying and whatever, and suddenly just this fear gripped my heart. This will happen. It won't, whatever. What if this? What if that? And I was like, oh God, please help me. Oh God, oh God, please help me. And it just kept on like a wave. Has that ever happened to you? It just kept on rolling over you and rolling over you. But fortunately, I had just recently read and been reminded that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And brothers and sisters, when the enemy comes in and roars like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, and that spirit of fear comes in, you and I have to recognize from the Word of God, we recognize what it is. It's not from God. It's from the enemy, but I'm a child of God. And because I'm a child of God, I don't have to accept it. I don't have to take it. It doesn't have to drown me. It doesn't have to devour me. I can take authority over this spirit of fear. I'm not saying we're demon possessed. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But there is, there is a spirit of fear that oppresses and paralyzes us. And do you know what I did in the car as I was driving along towards Lion Rock Tunnel? I started praying. I rebuke you, spirit of fear. I take authority over you in the authority that God has given me through Jesus Christ. I don't have any authority in myself, but I remember what I read in Hebrews chapter 2, which is that Jesus went to the cross and he died. And in dying and in taking my sin, he defeated the devil and the power of the devil. And therefore, I have that authority because he rose again and he said, I give you all authority to us and Jesus lives in me and so I started praying I take authority over you you spirit of fear and I was still afraid <laughs> and so I kept I'm just being honest we're keeping it real this morning because you know what the spirit of fear can be very strong so if you've prayed one time and you've taken authority and you're still afraid don't stop praying I, really don't keep on praying and just keep on standing I, I take authority over this. Lord, your word says. And to help me and to bolster my faith, I started quoting scripture. God, you have said this. God, you have said that. And after about five minutes, that spirit of fear <laughs> was gone, was gone. And I drove on to church. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm giving you that really practical example because we all face that. We all face that. Whether it's a spirit of fear whether it is a bing, bing, bing worry that hits you, whether it's a blanket of anxiety, you do not have to accept it because it's an agent of the enemy. You don't have to have it in your life. Amen? Amen. So that's the first step. You say, oh, it's, okay, keep, here we go. Next step. By faith, believe and confess that God is your loving dad. Or I wanted to put daddy because that's what Abba father. But all of us have in our own languages, we have familiar terms for fathers, don't we? Uh, I used to call my father daddy. And then I grew up and I called him dad. Uh, some people say papa. Or some people say, what, what do you say in Tagalog? <laughs> ah, there you go. What do you say? What do you say in, other, in French? Pastor? Papa. papa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other languages? What do you say? Huh? Ba, in Chinese, ba, right? Or, or something else like that. All of us. Yeah. Okay, ba, ba. So we have all... What? Yeah. So we have all these languages. And for saying our, our daddy, our daddy, right? A loving dad. So number two, number two, by faith, believe and confess that God is your loving dad. Remember what I told... The example I gave you just a minute ago about the young boy crying in the car. He's responsible you are not responsible. You have a loving father. You are not an orphan. You are not an orphan. The devil wants you to feel that you're on your own, that you're an orphan. Some of us are grieving over fathers that we didn't have or over fathers that were not loving and supportive and kind. I want to encourage you, stop grieving 
over the father that you didn't have. And beloved, start rejoicing that you have the best father in the whole world. You are the apple of his eye. He would do anything for you. He gave his only son for you. You are precious to him. When you were really ugly and sinful and his enemy, he gave you the best gift that he had because he loved you. You've got a good father. You've got a good father. Amen. And so by faith, believe and confess. When we look at this passage again, look what it says. The worry, worry, worry. He says, look at verse 32. Your heavenly father already knows your needs. Your father, your father. He's providing. And then from Luke 12. Don't be afraid, little flock. Because your father, what's that word? Delights, delights to give you the kingdom. So that's step two. Step one, it's an agent of the enemy. Worry, anxiety, fear, an agent of the enemy. Step two, believe and accept by faith that God is your loving father, okay? So that you're not alone. The devil can't isolate you. Number three, oh, and there you go. Cast all your anxieties on him. For he cares for you. You wonder, I'm alone. No, you're not alone. He cares for you. He knows what you're carrying. And he says, stop carrying it. Let me carry it for you. Stop worrying. I can handle it. I've got this. I've got this. So that's number two. Number three, admit your fear, anxiety, and worry without shame. Without shame. We're going to go just a few more minutes, but we're going quickly as we come to the end. Go through it one more time. Acknowledge your worry, anxiety, and fear. Some of us, especially, sorry, especially men, so sorry, but you know it's true, have a harder time. Right, Pedro? Because you got to be the man, right? You got to be tough. When I was growing up, I was so politically incorrect. Boys were told, don't cry. Be a big boy. Oh, dads, please don't tell your sons that. Moms, please don't tell your sons that. Don't cry. Be a big boy. Sometimes we need to cry. <laughs> and little boys, little boys need to cry too or whatever. But all of us, we don't want to admit our weakness. We don't, want to, we don't want to say, I'm scared of this. I'm afraid of this. May I say to you that the things that we keep in darkness are the devil's domain. And he can continue to attack us if it's in darkness. Let God shine his light on your fear, on your anxiety, on your worry. And when God shines his light, then... The shame is removed, and we can be helped. We can be helped. Talk with a close friend. You don't have to tell everybody. You don't have to stand up and say, I've got a testimony. I'm really afraid. Um, you don't have to do that. But you know what? Share with people that you trust and that love you. Talk with the pastors. But most of all, talk with God. Go to Him. Why do you go to Jesus? Because He understands our weakness, for He faced every testing we faced. You mean the, the test... The, the temptation to fear and to worry, anxiety. Yep, Jesus faced all of those, but he didn't fall. He didn't fail. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace. What are you going to receive when you open that up to the light and confess it to God? Do you know what you're going to receive? You are going to find mercy and grace to help you when you need it the most. When you need it the most. When you're really afraid. When you're really anxious. When you are just drowning in worry. So number one, worry, anxiety, and fear is what? Agent of the enemy. Number two, by faith, believe and accept that God is your loving Father. Number three, admit. Admit. Number four, submit your fear to God and His Word. Submit your fear. So what does it mean to submit? Submit means you take your fear to God and His Word. And you don't just say, God, here, here it is, Lord, take it. God gives us something else to do in this situation, okay? Here's what you do. You take it to God. God, I'm afraid. God, I'm worried. God, I'm anxious. Now do all of these other things. God, help me. And then what do you do? You stand and you announce to yourself and to God and to the devil, but I'm not going to make a decision based on my worry, on my anxiety, or on my fear. God, I'm going to make a decision based on your word. That's what I'm going to do. Brothers and sisters, that's what we've got to do. If we make decisions based on worry, fear, and anxiety, we will always make bad decisions. 
always make bad decisions because they're not based on truth. They're not based on truth. So I take it to God. I submit it to him. And then I'm going to do what God says. And I'm going to do what God's word says. Very quickly, here are two examples. You say, oh, that's a long verse. You just look at it. And then you write it down. You can go back to it later. This is the example when Moses is talking with the children of Israel and he was trying to get them to go into the land of promise and they were afraid because of the, of the giants and they said, no, God had promised them the land. God had said he would be with them. So they had God's word, but they saw the giants. They heard the report and they were afraid. What did they do with their fear? They made a decision on their fear. And what happened when they made a decision based on their fear? They said, let's go back to Egypt. Oh no, we can't do it. And because of the decision they made for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness. And Moses says, I tried to tell you. I tried to tell you, you know God is good. He goes before you. Don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. You saw him. He took care of you. Look at verse 31. So, so good. You saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. There's that picture again, right? Father, child, or mother and child. I sometimes see people walking around Hong Kong carrying kids that are almost as big as the parents are. And, uh, and the kid is asleep and whatever, but the loving parent is carrying that child. This, is, this was God for them. But rather than submitting it to God in his word, they made a decision based on fear. That's the, that's the negative example. Here's the positive example. You didn't get it in time, right? You were trying to you click it. You can look at my notes later. It, go back, Pastor, and it will be posted. You can look at it again. We can hear this message again. Here's the good one. Here's the good example. The good example is 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was king. It was only Judah, it, a, a small tribe that was left. The, the nation had divided by this time. And what happens, look with me, what happens is three different groups come up to make war on Jehoshaphat, who's a godly king. And the men came and they said, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. And he's all, and it's near, it's near. Look with me at verse three. Jehoshaphat was what? Afraid, afraid. afraid. Brother, and sis, brothers and sisters, there are circumstances that make us afraid. They really do. So what does Jehoshaphat do? He was afraid, so he resolved to seek the Lord. Here we go, brothers and sisters. Here's the positive example for you. So number, th the, third the fourth step is submit your fear to God and his word. So what did Jehoshaphat do? He went to the Lord with his fear and said, Okay, God, I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on, our eyes are upon you. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel. You see, brothers and sisters, if we want to solve our own worries and fears and anxieties, God will let us. He's not going to grab them out of our hands and say, Stop it. Sit down. I'm going to do it. No. He's a loving God. And if we say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, God says, Okay, do it. But if you and I go to Him in helpless, abandon oh God as his child and say, I don't know what to do but I'm looking to you God the father the loving heavenly strong powerful father says okay this is what I'm gonna do this is what I'm gonna do and that's what happens here so four submit and by the way you have to go back and read the rest of the story oh God does a great victory why they submitted Jehoshaphat submitted his fear to the Lord and to his word okay as we come to a close, here we go. Here's the really practical part. Turn every anxious thought, fear, and worry into a prayer until you have the victory. Until you have the victory. Okay? You worried about something? Instead of saying, what shall I do? Oh God, I lift this to you right now. When you wake up in the morning and you're thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Take your worry list. Take your bothering list and turn it into your prayer list. Okay? We know this so well. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. Remember, what did I tell you? Jesus appeared and he said, peace, be still. And when we take it to God, so take it. You worried about something? 
stop the worry and say, God, that is not from you. That's from the devil. Devil, I recognize. I recognize your plan. Nope. God, here this is. Take it to him. Take it to him. Take your worries. Turn them into prayers. If you're awakened in the night and you're worried about something, take that worry. Turn it into a prayer. Turn it into a prayer. You wake up in the morning and you're stressed about what you got to do that day. You're going to meet a client. You're going to whatever. You're going to whatever. Say, God, I have to meet a client today and I'm worried, but I recognize the devil's trying to do something here. God, would you help me with this client? Any one of these things. And the Lord himself, the Lord himself will be with us. His peace will guard our hearts and minds. So number one, eight, worry, anxiety, and fear an agent of the enemy. Number two, believe by faith. God is your loving father. Number three, uncover it. Uncover it. Don't let it stay in the dark. Number four, don't, don't be ashamed. Take it and he'll help. Number four, submit your fear to God and to his word. Number five, turn every anxious thought, fear, and worry into a prayer until victory. And we're going to stop there because it's time to stop. And we know um, I won't give you. I'll, there's the last one. I guess I'm stopping right there. <laughs> and, and finally, the most important thing. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> that's okay. The last one is, I don't know why it's not clicking, but that's okay. That's okay. Feed your faith. There you go. But we're going to pray now. Feed your faith. Feed your faith. How are you going to feed your faith? Go to God in His Word and just meditate on the Word of God. Just feed your faith and it's going to strengthen you. So we're going to close in prayer now. I'll come back to this last point at the end. And thank you. I know when I went on a little bit longer, but I really felt like we needed to, to cover this part. But would you join me right now? I've already gone through the process, but I'm going to go through it again. Because sometimes one time doesn't get it. Because other worries come, right? Other anxieties come and other fears come. I invite you right now just to, the Lord is here. And would you with me right now? And I'm going to pray for you. Just go through those steps very briefly right now. Whatever you're worried about. Whatever you're anxious about, whatever you're afraid about, just, just right now, just Lord, and you can do it quietly. You can speak it out if you want to. But Lord, right now, Father, I come to you, just each one of us, Lord, I come to you. And Lord, I recognize that the worry I've had, the anxiety and the fear I've had, it's agents of the enemy. He has planted this in my thoughts. He has planted this in my heart and I've been so afraid I take authority over this right now you just fill in the blank whatever it is I take authority over this I take authority in the name of Jesus I rebuke you spirit of fear and worry and anxiety I don't accept you in my life I will not give in to you any longer I see you for what you are and you have no place in my life because I'm a child of God and I belong to him. And he has not made me to worry, to be anxious, or to be afraid. And then, Lord, I accept by faith you are a good daddy to me. I am precious to you and you want to take care of me. And I've been trying to take care of myself and trying to control things. Lord, Father, I thank you. Daddy, I thank you that you're my daddy and you love me. Would you take care of these things that I've been worrying about? I just, I, I give them to you because you're my dad. And then, Lord, I, I just, I'm open with you. God, I confess I have been. I've been so afraid. And, and I didn't even want anybody to know because I was really, I couldn't even sleep at night. But, Lord, I've been afraid. Would you help me? Would you give me your grace and help me? I need you right now. I need you right now. And then, Father, I submit my fear and my worry and my, my anxiety to your word, to you and to your word. I am not going to make a decision based on worry, anxiety, or fear. I'm going to make a decision based on you and what you tell me to do according to your word. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'm going to feed my faith 
with your word. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And God, I'm not going to have a worry list. God, I'm going to have a prayer list from now on. Whenever worry strikes, I'm going to say, I'm going to pray to you. Whenever anxiety rolls over me, I'm going to turn it to you and pray. Whenever fear roars in my life, trying to paralyze me, I'm going to call out to you. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We receive by faith, and we take a step of faith this morning. We receive your peace. You say, peace be still. You say, peace be with us, and Lord, it is. We receive it. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. God bless you, beloved.